Welcome to the Idea Pod, a podcast dedicated to exploring and interrogating professional biomedical and applied ethics at the University of Leeds. For any new listeners, I am Gabby, a postgraduate researcher at the Idea Center working on AI and data ethics, and I'm proposing an ethical framework for bias and fairness in data science. For this episode, I am grateful to have Zach Goodmanson and Michael Cannon joining me. Zach Goodmanson is a fellow postgraduate researcher at the Idea Center working on AI ethics, particularly in using evolutionary approaches to developing AI that can behave ethically. And Michael Cannon is a postgraduate researcher from the Technical University of Eindhoven, working on the question of whether AI can become more ethical than humans. This episode is dedicated to analyzing one of the recent events we hosted at the Idea Center, the Philosophy and AI Workshop. Zach and I organized this event looking to integrate interdisciplinary perspectives to think about philosophical problems we can find in AI. Zach, as a co-organizer, what are your thoughts on this? And thanks, Gabby, for having me on the podcast. Um, when we started this workshop, we were really thinking about how to make philosophical theorizing about AI more inclusive and to get in all of those people who have maybe heard about what we're doing but weren't entirely sure what exactly it was and how it worked and maybe how they could apply that. So we really wanted to get as many people as possible to come and hear about how you can use philosophy in these kind of areas such as data and AI. And I think we're really successful in doing that. In a way, the pandemic postponing the workshop made things more difficult. But it, in another sense, because we could have it online and because we could get so many people from different areas, different backgrounds to come and listen to our speakers, then it was, it was very pleasing, even though we were postponed. One of the things that I realized while I was listening to the talks were how there were so many different ways of understanding things that I'd come at from maybe a philosophical perspective um, and that a data scientist or somebody else comes at it with a completely different set of assumptions. And it just goes to show that when we're applying things like philosophical concepts, then there's so much room for different interpretations. And when you're coming at it from a from a purely empirical background, then you've often got one way of interpreting that that's going to be different to ours. Yeah, that's right. And we're really grateful for everyone that attended our workshop. Over 300 people joined in person, live, and also looked at our YouTube live stream. So we're really happy with people from industry, academics, scholars, and other people from the general public joining. So I also agree that it was a success. And well, Michael, you're here because you also attended and you collaborated as one of the presenters. So what was your impression about the workshop? Hi, Gabby. Hi, Zach. Uh, yeah, delighted to be here. Um, as, an attend- as an attendee, it was, it was great, frankly. It was great. It was easy. It was stimulating. And, and I think in part that, you know, it's short and it was sweet. It wasn't all day. Um, and I think that these these kinds of academic conferences uh, can all too easily become that kind of thing. So uh, yeah, I thought uh, hats off to you. a well uh, a well done event that was a lot of fun. Great, I, I'm glad you enjoyed it. So now we're going to move on to analyze some of the talks. Well, all of the talks actually that we had at the event. We had different presentations, and we could divide them into two main big themes, um, being theory and practice. So let's take a look at the first theme. Three presentations fall into this category. So the first one would be David Strawmeyer's presentation on ontology, neural networks and the social sciences. Vincent Mueller's presentation on orthogonality and existential risk from AI. And Johannes Wotz's talk on creativity called Machine Made Jabberwocky. I suggest we start with David's. Um, He presented a very interesting idea about artificial neural networks and their connection to social sciences and the ontological assumptions involved in this. So, um, Zach, what were some of the highlights you could tell us about this presentation? 
David is speaking about models in social science and how they make ontological assumptions. So something about how social science models can assume the domain of a social concept. So he uses the example of family a lot and how we can make assumptions about what it constitutes to be part of a family. We know as philosophers, we expect that fa family is a kind of a very general, a fuzzy concept. Sometimes things are inside or outside and it's not really always clear to know. And when you're programming, then you need your data not to be fuzzy. You need to have nice clean lines. You say this is inside and this is outside. So we've naturally got this problem of our social concepts are really fuzzy and our data needs to be really clean and divided. And the question that David asks is, can neural networks help us reduce assumptions? And his answer is they can, but not entirely. So how, how do they reduce assumptions? Well, neural networks work by creating a kind of representation within their system. So they don't take information from a programmer who's saying this is what this concept is. It looks at the data and it creates its own lines of, of the, where the concept can be. So that stops any assumption from a person who's just assuming that this is part of a concept or not part of a concept. Um, and in this way, then it does reduce assumption. However, he said that Although it can reduce ontological assumptions, those ontological assumptions can still get in. And that's through two paths, um, data and engineering. So while neural nets are useful, they aren't these holy grails which can prevent all of our ontological assumptions about social concepts. So, so even if the neural net isn't assuming what a concept is, then the data still can be. So there's a classic example of this, of like bias and of assumptions and data. Sometimes the data is trained on just a fairly neutral uh, database. It's not given any concepts to look for. But then when it describes a concept, it still describes something which reflects the bias in the data. So there's, there's a classic kind of thing. If you type um, person working, then the image that comes up on Google search is a white man at a computer desk. And you haven't told any kind of algorithm or anything like that that you want to see white man at a computer, but it, it already associates the concept of work with the, with the concept of the white man at computer desk. So that's already one of these ontological assumptions. And okay, in this case, we don't know the algorithm, but it could well be that the algorithm itself is neutral or the neural net is neutral with regard to the assumption, but it's taking the assumption from the data just because all of our pictures of people working happen to be white guys who are, who are at a computer desk. Um, so that's the first one, which is by data. The second one is through architecture. This one is a little bit more technical, but it's essentially that when you're coding a neural net, then you still have to make some decisions about how the, the data is related. So it's, it's not so simple as just to say, okay, now do this. You still have to make some architectural considerations. So if you're training a neural net to recognize like a dog, for example, then it might be first, okay, throw out all of the pictures of sky and then look for all things with brown and four legs, something like that. But the thing is that the order of these can make a difference and can be an assumption. So if you had this, okay, throw out all the pictures of sky first, then you would never catch a flying dog. Of course, normally that's kind of fine because dogs don't fly. But the point being that you've brought in that assumption. You've already assumed that dogs don't fly. And when we're thinking about more social concepts, if you bring in that assumption, you know, it could be like a biased social assumption. You bring that into the architecture, then it can influence the, the outputs of the neural net. In summary, the neural net can reduce the use of ontological assumptions in social science models, but it can't do it all of the way because there's still going to be assumptions in both the data and possibly also the architecture. So overall, I really enjoyed this talk. I thought it's a really good point that neural networks can reduce these assumptions. Normally, I think of the assumptions which are in the data and which are also in the architecture, but I, I didn't think about how our classic symbolic networks are so easy to introduce assumptions into. And neural networks are better. And I thought that was really the main takeaway from me. That's great. Thank you, Zach. Um, let's continue with uh, Professor Mueller's talk on orthogonality and existential risk from AI. Michael, you were also co-author of this paper presented here. So I am sure you can give us a first-hand opinion about this particular topic, perhaps 
introduce some of our listeners to what these concepts are and why they tend to be very popular amongst the generalized AI discussions that we can find in the field? Sure, yeah. Effectively, what we were responding to was there's just something that seems odd about the now standard story or narrative about how kind of fairly simple systems that we have now might become super intelligent, you know, the orders of magnitude more intelligent than us and thereby become an existential risk, a risk to the existence of humanity. There's just something very funny about the story that just doesn't quite sit right. And so for some time, we've kind of been trying to, to, to figure out you know, what if there was some kind of blurriness in the concepts or fuzzinesses, which means that, that the story can happen, but it's not entirely consistent. And so where we went with that was effectively to do some, a bit of a conceptual analysis of the notions of intelligence that turn up in these stories. I don't know, maybe, maybe would it be effective if I just uh, gave a super quick rundown of what the story is, as, as I understand it? Yeah, sounds good. Okay, I mean the the this I mean the story is kind of almost infamous now of and a a bit of a caricature but kind of paradigmatic example anyway is the notion of a paperclip maximizer and there are problems with this example but but it, it's it's useful. So we just start out with some system that's got some very simple goal, right? Maybe some paperclips. And so the idea is, or how, or how the story goes anyway, is that well the the, the system realizes that heck if I was smarter. Um, I could make paper clips better, faster, stronger, whatever. Devote some resources, divest some resources to self-improvement. And so as it goes along making its paper clips, it's continually self-improving. And there's this positive feedback loop such that when it becomes more intelligent or as it becomes more intelligent, its capacity to make paper clips and more importantly, figure out how to self-improve becomes greater. So yeah, this, this kind of, it becomes this exponential loop, uh, this exponential trend. You know, eventually just becomes super intelligent, and all the while, you know, it's requiring more and more resources to to execute the function of making paper clips to to higher and higher standards, and eventually, say, it exhausts all the natural resources on the planet for making paper clips. Um, and then, but meanwhile, you know, it's it's reached a level of intelligence where it can do some kind of molecular rearrangement and 3D printing, and so it turns to humans and life on Earth and says, well, hey, you guys are made out of atoms that I can rearrange into structures of tin and aluminium, so now I can make tons and tons of paper clips. And so it turns humans and animal life into paper clips and all life. It's those kind of stories where a really innocuous system becomes nuts. And there's just something a bit odd about this story. Oh, this, we think of there's something going on with the notion of intelligence. Um, and what are and our, what we what we said was that well there seem to be two different notions of intelligence at work in in this kind of story uh, where and, the, and we differentiate them as instrumental in general and these these differentiations of intelligence turn up in the literature on 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 AI and intelligence and so on they're fairly common basically right where instrumental intelligence is kind of you assume the end we assume the goal and its intelligence is this kind of optimization process toward that goal. Um, and that, that makes a lot of sense, right? We have we have some possibility space we're trying to navigate, and there are different ways to navigate it, and more intelligence consists in something like a better navigation of that possibility space by whatever metric. And then and then and then general intelligence is, you know, so we're talking here, um, and so what is relevant here in our frame of reference is going to be a certain set of things, and then when we're done here and we go off to make dinner and whatever. So different things become relevant because we're in different frames of reference talking to different people. So this an important feature of this general intelligence seems to be this capacity to navigate different frames of reference where our sort of goals and so on change. And people have made various attempts to try and integrate these two. And, 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 our, and our goal in this paper wasn't to offer a account of intelligence, but simply to say, hey, there seems to be both of these things at work, where we start off with a paperclip, just being like, right, I'm going to optimize paperclip maximization, and then somehow realizes that, well, heck, humans are made out of these things that I can rearrange it into paperclips. And for us, that seemed more like general intelligence because it, it, it's adopting a new frame or navigating into a new frame of reference. And yeah, so so that's kind of all we were saying. And to the extent that the, 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 that kind of difference holds. And um, then we need to rethink our narrative about story about how AI becomes an existentialist. 
Great. Thanks, Michael. Um, and finally, we have one a more presentation that was based on this section we've called theory. And it was uh, Ioannis Bozzi's machine made Jabberwocky. And um, now this is a very interesting proposal because Ioannis gave all of our attendees something to think about in terms of, you know, do you think AIs will ever be as creative as humans? We actually had a poll during the event that asked this question and 74% of the attendees said that they think AIs will be as creative as humans, but they will have a different type of creativity. So very interesting. It was definitely something that people engaged with. And uh, Zach, uh, what was your impression about this talk? Well, I, I thought it was a very interesting talk. I think it's a question that a lot of us intuitively have. Can an AI be creative or not? And that's exactly what Ianos talks about. The first thing that he spoke about was how we define creativity, which is a classic philosophical starting position. As you might expect, creativity just can't be defined that well. There are some theories, but none are universally accepted. And um, he came with something like maybe original and uh, maybe valuable. But then, and then he explained that there were some arguments that a lot of people have. And I think for a lot of people intuitively, they think that AIs can't be creative. He categorizes these as an argument based on autonomy, an argument based on psychopathology, and an argument based on uh, the ability to think over-inclusively. And he thinks that none of these arguments are completely effective in claiming that AIs can't be creative. So if we want to be sure that AIs can't be creative, then we should come up with some stronger arguments. And um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about one of the arguments, which I think was the most interesting, which is the one from autonomy. I think it's against Margaret Bowden, who said that an, an AI can't have autonomy and therefore it can't be creative. Ioannis came up with two reasons why he thinks that an AI can have the relevant kind of autonomy. The first one is that humans don't really have a very well-developed sense of autonomy either. So that might be very surprising to, to most of us because it seems as if we're the benchmark for autonomy. We're the peak of autonomy. But if you think about, for example, environmental effects on our minds, um, evolutionary effects on our minds and bodies, um, the whole developmental psychology, nature and nurture, we are determined, at least in some form, at least our possibilities are constrained by our biological and psychological makeup. And Ianis argues that insofar as we're constrained, an AI is also constrained. So to say that we're both stuck in the same box means that if we can be creative, then an AI can be creative. Now, how is, how is an AI constrained in the same way of us, in a similar way to us? Well, make the analogy between evolution and human design. Humans were designed, uh, in quote, by evolution, and AIs were designed by us, literally. And the same for environmental effects. An AI can train and learn based on its, its information, its data, and we can train and learn on our experience. If we think that this is convincing, then it seems like whatever level of autonomy we have, then an AI we must have a similar kind of level of autonomy. So it, it makes no sense to say that an AI can't be creative because it can't be autonomous, since we also have a similar kind of level of autonomy in terms of we were we were both designed, we're both constrained by our environmental experience. And he really he brings this out in this thought experiment, which I really liked. I thought I thought it was really fun. Start off with the premise of imagine that there is a machine race that's become highly advanced. Um, and this this machine race creates a new biological species, and then this biological species, which he calls Mada, um, then produces creative works after, after being trained uh, by these machines. The question then is, is Mada creative? And if we say she's not creative, and if we say she's not creative because she was designed by this machine race, she was created by them, then we're, we're kind of begging the question. The answer cannot be no because she's designed and nurtured, because um, she's designed and created, because that would be begging the question. The very question is, 
can something that's designed, can something that's created be creative or not? If we say, no, that's just impossible as a matter of concept, then we're not really going through with the intuition itself. If we say no, then we should explain why she can't be creative. So putting that to one side, if we say yes, Mada, who, as far when I was imagining this thought experiment, I was thinking of her as like a human. Um, obviously, she wouldn't have to be a human, but if it works, then in your mind, just imagine that there's this machine race that's created like a little human. This human has been creative. And intuitively, to me, it seems like, hmm, yeah, this, this human, this Mada, is creative, but she was designed. And I thought, so for me, this thought experiment was, was fairly effective in making me think, yeah, in that case, then, there's no reason why we shouldn't think that machines, like an AI that is designed, can't be creative. I was wondering what you thought about that kind of idea, whether you agreed with that thought experiment. I guess my take is like that there's a thought, I like the thought experiment. For me, the, the, the relevant question or the, the, the relevant heuristic or, I don't know, the way of asking or unasking the question of whether AI can become or you know, be creative in the way that we can is, um, is a question for me, not of whether there are functions which we would call creative and whether those functions are can be realized in things we call machines. But I don't know, I don't know this, this line that properties presuppose the individual in question. And so for any kind of pose, the individual or the agent that we're talking about. And I think, I think that's important because it shifts the question from a, a matter of conceptual analysis of the property of creativity. And we're like, well, this creativity relies on autonomy or intelligence is this kind of thing or ethics is this kind of thing. It's just not the kind of thing that a machine could or could not have. You know, I, I, for me, instead, it's like a, a question about about the nature of the individual itself and the, the principles of individuation of that individual, because kind of at least as physical individuals humans for example are, are autopoetic self-creating complex systems it generates a frame of reference it generates a perspective yeah it's a sense of self from which the world is engaged it, it generates the con a condition of possibility for meaning i think for me the, the question um about creativity is it's, it's not so much a question of conceptual analysis of, of of you know what is creativity and how do we define the function of creativity or define it in functional terms such that it can be realized in an alternative substrate or a machine. But for any property we're talking about, it pre a property presupposes an individual. And then there's this question of, well, you know, is this kind of individual in an ontological sense, the kind of thing which is, you know, for which it makes sense to talk about creativity? That to me seems like a, a, a generative line of questioning and one which the thought experiment Kind of doesn't quite get to, but but the thought experiment I like is creative. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. Well, now let's take a look at the practical um, side of the workshop. Um, the remaining three presentations talked a bit more about the implementation, development, and deployment of AI solutions into society. So we had Professor David Hogg talking about AI and common sense. Dr. Paula Boddington presenting on AI and the theory and practice of dementia, and Professor John McDermott about ethical issues regarding embodied and autonomous AI systems. So I'm going to head off and talk a little bit about Professor Hogg's presentation on common sense. And this relates to the ability we humans have to make sense of certain decisions or sensible decisions in a practical way. And the way that we are able to speculate about real possibilities of AIs to develop it. So this is a very unexplored topic, given the limitations AIs have in the present day. Much of the reasoning and explanations are still given by a human in the loop um, that kind of provides this sense check. So there is always, to some extent, a human there involved in any kind of reasoning. So we require a degree of explainability from AI systems in order to be able to make sense of it, and that we don't from humans. Normally, when a human reacts in a what we would call a common sense way, we don't tend to require much explanations for why they've done what they, what they did. So would it be possible to teach that kind of almost 
difficult but also innate capability we have to make sense of things. So it is interesting that Professor Hogg points out how AI systems learn from a different environment that is somehow given to them. In contrast, with humans that have interacted with their environment throughout their evolutionary process. So it's almost like there is a, an initial difference that is how AI systems are developed in a very contained space. And so he proposed an idea on how we could start trying to develop this common sense in artificial systems by exploring the possibility of the language of thought hypothesis. This idea explained in a very simplified way, considers that thoughts can have a language-like structure, similar to the compositional structures that we have in our spoken language. So the whole idea of the language of our thoughts is that we have the capacity to operate under rules of logic and syntax that make it possible for us to elaborate causal thinking of many kinds. And if this is the case, if there is this kind of like structure underlying logical rules and syntax, according to Professor Hogg's view, it could be possible to exploit the richness we already have developed for language models and make it applicable. Currently, we have successfully deployed it in AI systems and we have been able to develop a similar language of thought to train the system into having this kind of like common sense like language structure. This, of course, implies many challenges, particularly at capturing the nuances that we normally do quite smoothly get as humans. Um, you probably know that AI systems or conversational AIs are unable to grasp sarcasm or jokes as easily as we do. And that's one of the challenges that is very obvious for everyone. It is hard for us to explain how these things really work. Any influences that we have in the way we learn and develop are still a mystery to us. To some extent, we have been able to, for example, track differences in nurture and nature, and when it comes to explaining how different organisms can differ so much despite being exposed to similar, if not the exact same environment. And I think this also tells us something about the expectations we rely on AIs, why we need perhaps AIs to develop a certain kind of common sense is to make them more reliable and to increase their self-explanatory capabilities, allow us to interact with them and through them at a much deeper level. Because one of the, the, the main questions that we can have is sort of like, why would we want AIs to develop this common sense that is unique to humans? So it might be related to this ability to be self-explanatory and create deeper relationships with these technologies. If we can make AIs to produce the same level or at least a similar quality of inferences based on the inputs they receive, any type of knowledge they can have from the data we feed them, we will be able to give them a more integrated use into our lives. So if an AI is capable to infer that the cat cannot open the door by itself, and that the meowing is an attempt to receive help with that action, the possibilities of having, for example, embodied AIs helping in our daily lives is going to increase. And to achieve something like that through David's proposal, we would not need higher levels of consciousness or self-awareness to achieve it but rather just a robust enough language model that allow us for common sense reasoning to arise. This also touches, I think, on one of the main ethical concerns the general public has and is trust. We can rely on AIs to have structural language models that allow them to explain and trace their train of thoughts to us. We should be able to trust their interactions a lot more not only because they would have an increased level of explainability, like I said, but also because they could interact with their environment, however limited, in a more human-like way. And maybe that would also allow us to relate to them a little bit more. If this is a desirable or necessary thing, I think it's part of the question as well. 
And it's a whole other debate that will require us to think about the goals and aims we expect from the development of common sense for AI system. For me, the first question would have to be, why do we want to achieve this uh, by developing it, rather than just questioning if this is technically possible? But certainly, it's really interesting to see how something that seems so far-fetched can still be achievable with the tools that we already have. And now let's move on to our next presenter that spoke to us about an applied problem, and it was Paula Boddington. She presented some of the difficulties of implementing AI solutions to help dementia patients, thinking about improving the humanity of care. So contrasting the increased cognitive capacity usually related to AI development with the decreased cognitive abilities involved in dementia. So there were various interesting claims and a call to look where technology is indeed needed. So, um, Michael, what were some of the things that you got from this presentation in particular? I really, I really liked what Paula did uh, in her presentation. It, it, it echoes a little bit what, what you finished um, saying there, you know, whether this is asking whether this is really something we want to to do uh, and develop with respect to the common sense you're just talking about there in AI systems rather than just is this something we can do is this technically possible what i got from her presentation was that rather than just another exploration of whether an, yet another domain can be colonized by automate by automation it's a kind of an exploration of just what what is care what really is involved in care but kind of done where we say, what is it, what are the limits of what AI is able to do here in this space? And by, in discerning those limits, we kind of come to understand more about the, the nature of the care that, you know, we care about, that that, that, that really makes a difference to um, folks with, who are suffering with dementia. Yeah, that, it, was, it, was, it was as if a, an exploration of the negative space around the potential of AI here, which I, which I really liked. I really also just appreciated how much that she personally seemed to be moved by it, uh, kind of enacting and expressing the very same care that she she was trying to sort of understand. A real uh, exploration of, of the much needed humanity in this space. I like that a lot. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I, during the presentation, we could all see Paula's motivation and engagement, and she was very committed to this idea. And obviously that was very appreciated by everyone. Now, finally, we have the presentation from Professor John McDermott, and he talked about embodied AI. For this last presentation, uh, he gave various different examples about um, robotics and autonomous systems, the certain challenges of uh, machine learning, making sense of uh, training data. He uh, showed some videos. It was very interactive. And then he finally moved on to um, his proposal that was based on how responsible autonomous systems could be able to be considered proxy agents. Uh, this proposal basically was saying that we could perhaps conceive autonomous systems as proxy agents, and this could be helpful to elucidate issues of responsibility assigned to autonomous systems. So the proposal talks about how that could allow us to transfer agent responsibility in some cases. I suspect uh, in very limited or very manageable cases. And it could also help to understand liability as well. So it can be possible to allocate different functions and therefore establish a degree of responsibility of the autonomous systems. So this division would distinguish fully human from only proxy agent and shared functions and help to explain, describe, and therefore incorporate responsibility associated with particular functions. And so it was very, a very interesting proposal, I think, because it integrated very well technical aspects with our theoretical background for autonomy and agency. And so Professor McDermott was able to show how an engineering system, a mechanical system, could be able to be responsible for certain things as a proxy agent. So, for example, a self-driving car would be able to respond 
to a certain degree of responsibility based on tasks that could be completely autonomous to uh, the self-driving agent. It could be uh, related to the human in the loop. So it would be kind of like a transfer type of responsibility as well. And then aspects that are not really related at all with the embodied AI, but rather remain human. And so understanding proxy agents, I think it's a good way in which we can move forward discussing um, the possibilities of responsibility for AI systems that are embodied, because part of the worries that a lot of researchers have is that we kind of like reach a wall when it comes to understanding to what degree we are actually able to hold them accountable. And so in some sort of sense, I think having them as these like proxy agents could perhaps be a way to increase clarity, not only in policy making and legislation, but also conceptual clarity to really move forward in terms of defining the theoretical scope to talk about the autonomy of these systems and the level of responsibility that they can actually achieve. So I think that was a really interesting talk and that it was really refreshing to see so many practical examples of how machine learning actually visualizes a problem and it kind of connected to a little bit with our ideas of what these machines are actually able to achieve and not just what we think they, they can do. So finally, uh, we're heading to the end of the podcast and I would like for us to comment a little bit on the future of AI. We asked uh, three of the speakers in this event the following question. What are the main challenges you see for the development of AI in the near future? And these are their responses. David Strohmeyer. So the biggest question for me there is how much further we can push artificial neural networks. I've been personally been surprised by how far we've pushed them already. So I've expected progress there to slow down more than it has. Um, but there is a challenge in trying to find ever new ways of varying neural architectures and trying to adapt them to all the tasks we have, it's that they reach the standard of we want to reach with AI so that they reach general artificial intelligence at some point. The, there might also be the option of trying to find ways to integrate them with other technologies, which is the other way of looking at the challenge. How can you actually embed um, artificial neural networks in larger computational systems, perhaps some symbolic forms of AI, which is not entirely uncommon. There are definitely a lot of research going on in that direction. But so far, it has been relatively limited in its success. Paula Boddington. One of the main challenges that I see in the development of AI and focusing on value issues in AI and the ethics of AI, there's a lot of work going on looking very closely at a lot of the technical aspects of this. For example, how to technically achieve transparency and privacy and so on, which is really great. But I'm worried that they might become a divorce with that kind of really te technically focused work and for more the broader ethical issues, and in particular that the ethical issues might become untethered from the underlying philosophical and ideological issues. So that's, I see, that's one of the main issues I see as maintaining that really, really strong and vibrant interdisciplinary dialogue between people to make certain that, so I feel there's, there's possibly a danger that we might um, decide or in some areas of AI decide that, oh, we now know what the ethical issues are. We have to worry about transparency, accountability, privacy, and so on. And, and I think there's a potential for a really interesting dialogue between that, because as, for example, as people look, say that the technical issues about privacy, you've got to relate those to cultural issues of privacy, and you've got to relate those to ideas about how we understand the human person, what is an individual, what do we owe to society. So we need to really maintain that really, really close dialogue between what might seem like really abstract philosophical issues and really, really close, concrete, technical issues. Finally, Vincent Müller. For the development of AI in the future in a way that is beneficial to society, there are a number of obstacles. Essentially, they boil down to technical solutions 
that will allow exploitation by some uh, agents in the in that sphere uh, that is in the interest of these agents but not in the interest of society um, that will include basically monopolistic developments so winner takes all markets where one player in the market takes the market over that's one sphere that we already see and the other area will be areas where um, the use of AI is beneficial to uh, the, the agent that uses it, but not beneficial to the society overall, for example, uh, for surveillance purposes or opaque decision-making or things like that. So I, I think the, the challenge is a standard challenge that we've seen in the history of uh, technology and, de- and economic development uh, many, many times, that particular interests were in contrast with societal interests. It's just that this challenge needs to be uh, addressed uh, now because the challenge is new. So it, I think it is analogous roughly to the environmental challenge. So uh, we used to have uh, a challenge that people started, I don't know, having, for example, chemical factories, right, that were beneficial to the people involved in these chemical factories but were uh, polluting uh, the rivers uh, nearby in a significant way. So that was a new phenomenon that, that a company could do that kind of a thing. And then we, after a significant delay, we defined regulations to try and prevent this kind of thing from happening. So something like that, I think, is, is happening in AI right now, actually, and will happen in several iterations in the future until we hopefully reach a point where we sort of feel that we are settled and we have a proper societal response to these challenges. Now I would like us to um, comment a little bit what we think about this. Let's start with uh, David's response. Personally, I think that pushing artificial neural networks and neural architectures and adapting them to different tasks embedded in larger and computational systems was a really interesting sort of challenge that we face. It, it, it's all about how we include them for me. That, that's the real challenge. It's not just about being able to do it, uh, it's just how we design these tasks and what type of goals we are seeking to uh, attribute to, to them. What are your thoughts on this? So along the same lines of, of what you were saying, I was thinking less about how AIs or artificial neural networks can solve problems and more about how they can solve. So, so particularly... Yes, it's difficult to embed them in computational systems and to adapt them to do certain things. We may reach barriers in being able to fulfill that kind of aim. But how we do it is is also highly important, especially how it integrates with society, how people are going to respond to it how it can respond to people, especially as it gets more complicated and people are going to interact with it more and understand it less. And so for me, as, as an ethical focused person, then I'm thinking about how that relationship is going to play out. Yeah. And uh, so for Paula's, you know, comment on the future of AI, I thought it was really interesting that she focuses on value issues in AI. So it's all about the risk that we already see of technical aspects overriding ethical explanations and principles. She mentions transparency and how this applies to privacy, bias, fairness, interpretability, and etc. So maintaining, I think I really like this. So maintaining a vibrant interdisciplinary collaboration is what seems to be one of the challenges. And and I agree. I, I think that moving forward, Many of the issues that we have experienced in the past can be prevented and uh, fixed with proper theoretical aims addressing these value issues. So uh, I thought that was um, quite spot on. I don't know what what you guys thought. Yeah, I I agree with you and I agree with Paula. I think she's she's on the money with a lot of it. Um, It makes me think of, for example, Google dismantling their AI ethics committee and my experience with engineers who might not be that interested in ethical concept. In in a similar way to the to what David's response made me think. Um, I'm also thinking about whether moving forward we can make some new ethical concept, whether through all of this development, like maybe things like 
privacy and bias are going to still be issues, but maybe we're going to come up with some new ethical concepts for, for how we're going to relate to AI. And maybe that's going to be an interesting development in value theory. Yeah, and that, that kind of links in with uh, sort of what Vincent is saying in terms of he he's talking about um, how we're normally driven to see all these problems about new technologies and their disciplines as new challenges. But if we look closely, they're just a different version of the same issues that we have been dealing with for centuries. And we're probably going to keep dealing with in the future. But it's just all about how we change conceptual takes on these problems. So there are essential philosophical queries that surround the development of AI in its relation to society and and so it's all about having that proper societal response, I, I think, is is implying that it does not matter how advanced we are technically. At some point, the old problems that we have faced um, in the past will catch up with us. And I think connecting with what you were saying, Zach, is, is exactly the same thing, because it's just trying to figure out that we don't have to remain in the same place and that philosophically as well, we are challenged to think differently about issues that we have faced before, but that might require new conceptual distinctions to help us actually solve these problems. What is your take on all of this, Mikey? I kind of, a, you know, I like, for example, that Vincent was talking about the environment, and, and I don't know. I, I guess I can, I, I guess I can summarize my sense that with the line that balls roll downhill, right, and that it says a huge amount that AI was effectively born as a field in the throes of the Second World War, where we needed computers, artificial computers. We needed artificial computers that were capable of calculating, doing the differential equations for what happens when we set off a nuclear bomb. Um, And that you know, on the other side of, of, of the Atlantic, the theoretical work for a lot of these systems was being laid out by Turing and so on, and again in a war effort. And so that these tools are employed to or incentivized and kind of developed, born into existence for these kinds of purposes. I think that says a lot. And so looking forward, you know, in terms of what are the main challenges, I would find myself thinking a lot about the landscape into which we bring and apply these various systems. Um, And so that's kind of what I'm thinking about balls roll downhill, right? Like a lot is made of the moral neutrality of technologies, depending on the landscape uh, into which they're brought, right? Certain things are easier to do and certain things are harder to do. So I kind of, um, I hear them all saying and, and, and certainly share this sentiment, you know, like, let's be clear about or let's try to be clear about what we care about and enable our capacity. What do we have to do to, to ensure and enable ourselves to make good choices and make the good choices easy and the hard choices hard, which is, I think, ultimately becomes a matter of, of things that are much larger than just the AI space. Great. Yeah. And if we put it all together, it all seems to point at the same direction. Like you said, it's it's about thinking that even if we face uh, potentially different and new technologies and systems and challenges in the future, we still have that responsibility of really grasping what we have now. What are the challenges that we have been facing for a while and how we can, uh, in a very collaborative way, try to fix them and always keeping in mind that societal and ethical perspective that brought us all together for that workshop. And so on that note, I would like to thank you both for joining me today. It has been a delightful talk and I really appreciate your insights. So thank you, Zach. And thank you, Mikey. And everyone else, thank you for listening and joining us. Until next time. The Idea Pod is produced by the Interdisciplinary Ethics Applied Center at the University of Leeds. Music composed and conducted by Josh Armitage. <laughs>